Good morning. Welcome to Terra at Home. I'm here with Dave Machulis from Natural Landscape Magazine. Nice to have you on the show again. Thanks for having me again. We're always in such great environments when I'm with you. Outside, this time we have a fire because we're in October cooling off and we cooled off early this year. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it's always nice to have this. But great part about your whole philosophy with landscaping and, uh, you know, and design is try to use our space for longer periods of time. Right. That's right. It's, yeah. Summer's not about two months and back no. inside your house. Yeah. Let's use it for as long as we can. That's right. And like this, this is what we can do, right? Well, that's been my biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and I've had so many people come to me and say, really, I, do I want to invest in such a short weather period for Canada? Right. And I say, well, if you can use it all year round, then here's one of the solutions. Uh, bringing in this nice, wonderful fire table mm -hmm. uh, really allows that uh, evening conversation to transition from the dining area to the living room area, mm -hmm. as we would call this the living room. Sure. And the extension of that warmth comes from this fire table here. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, you can extend it all year round. If mm -hmm. you're really feeling uh, you want to come out in December with the, the snow around, mm -hmm. uh, stoke up the fire and, and have a conversation with a nice glass of Merlot. And how great is that? And the best part about this, this is low maintenance, right? Absolutely. Where, I yes. mean, you just yeah. literally turn it on, turn it off, done. That's so it. you don't have to be worrying about, you know, finding firewood and nope. uh, the whole setup with that. This is easy and it's going to encourage you again to come outside and enjoy the elements because, you know, we do have long winters sometimes. So, yeah. you know, get outside and enjoy it. It's beautiful and it's great to be out in the cool, crisp air That's and right. have some sense of uh, some warmth as well. So let's talk in general about this property um, that uh, that you designed. And mm -hmm. again, it must be so fun for you walking in because you never know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful about this property are there are beautiful little streams running through. Well, that was one of the main attributes. And when I met the clients and if you kind of look to that, the outdoor living environment, which traditionally would be at the back of a home, mm -hmm. The front of the home, in essence, is the back of the home. Right. And they have the most wonderful view of the stream uh, mm -hmm. as it goes, uh, feeds down, down the way. And yeah. so we decided to look at an vantage points that allowed them to appreciate everything surrounding the longness of the yard. Mm -hmm. So the dining area, which most people traditionally will have right out the back door of a house, we pulled it away from the house. Mm -hmm. We brought it close to the, the edge of the stream. To create that outdoor room feeling, right. we used a pergola accenting the white accent off the house. So now we have a pergola that creates an outdoor room effect. So it there's does. your dining it's room. It's amazing. It, it, you know, there, there, there are beams, and yeah. it's, but it's not walls, but somehow it creates that space. Outdoor space. Yes. Yeah. And then from the flow of the dining area, we mm -hmm. move the living room area where we're sitting at right now. Mm -hmm. And a few other interesting challenges that uh, came upon me when I saw this big gas meter right in the front of the house right behind us and here. <laughs> uh, it was one of the challenges what do we do with that and I mm -hmm. said well why don't we pick up the oversized flagstone that we've made the patio with mm -hmm. take one of those pieces of that architecture invert it as a baffle in front of the the uh, gas meter and then put some ornamental grasses to soften the whole view up nice. and back there are all the controls for the barbecue the controls for the outdoor fire table awesome. all hidden away and who knew right and that's the great part as you say you wouldn't want if you're encouraging people to be outdoors you mm -hmm. don't want that all sitting there and exposed right it's not no. comfortable no. so by these ornamental grasses really fill out yes. and just block it up completely so that's yeah. actually a great idea and that's part of your job as well I mean you're going in to make things look beautiful and uh, and again just usable space for mm -hmm. people you have to kind of think of everything and people yeah. are you know some high, ex high expectations I'm sure sometimes <laughs> yeah well you know and it's in the details sure. it's little details like that that we try to cover mm -hmm. yeah. so again encouraging people to be outdoors and but still trying to keep the natural which of course natural landscape you're still trying to keep that and that seems to be what a lot of people are looking for right it's just uh, you know obviously people have different tastes and mm -hmm. there are lots of different styles out there that's right so um, how do you know exactly what somebody is looking for you know you know how to create the space but how mm -hmm. do you know style wise if they don't really know well you look at the surrounding environment mm -hmm. so where we're sitting right now is large tree setting we've mm -hmm. got a natural stream not a man-made stream flowing right through the yard right. so at that point we also talk about personal preferences and right away 
they were in very much agreement that they wanted to maintain the natural surrounding environment mm -hmm. to keep it natural, not contemporary, not modern. Uh, so at this particular point, you see a lot of natural stone, yes, uh, yes. the oversized flagstone, even the, the paving material that's used has a surface, textured surface to it that mm -hmm. still resembles an extension of natural stone. Love that. Yeah. I love that. And you know, that's what's the great part about it again is this, you're encouraging people to use the space and stay outside. Okay. So you're having people over and of course we know that even into October, sometimes even into November, we can have some very warm days. Yeah. And so you have a great time outside, it starts to cool down at night, nights mm -hmm. get cool and just let people mingle around, spread out, come around the fire. Yeah. And you know, it, it just really encourages people to stay outside. That's right. Well, and sitting I, here right now, yes. it's like we're wearing our jackets. Mm -hmm. It's cooler. Right. But right now with the, the heat that's coming from this, oh, yeah. I feel like wearing a t-shirt. I Yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling warm right now. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, you know, and that's the great part. And again, you have to really think about the plant life you're putting in here as well, right? Other than from the, you know, the hardscape, um, you know, to the landscape and the, the plant life, if you know, if you have like some nice winds, you're having movement from the grass. Mm -hmm. Again, people want to feel kind of cozy. So mm -hmm. have Having a lot of this and also what's going to happen to a lot of this plant life as we hit fall and hit winter For the and, colors, and the colors and, and yeah. exactly so if people are going to be outside what is it going to look like in the winter yeah what is this plant life going to look like and you yeah. obviously know what we're going to need what we need to use that's right because some of it doesn't look so great <laughs> no well the neat thing about ornamental grasses mm -hmm. is that if you don't cut them back they mm -hmm. have structure to them in the yes. winter time um, things like uh, the locust trees or the dogwood trees, when mm -hmm. snow falls on them, mm -hmm. they capture the snow and then yes. night lighting at night can illuminate that. So mm -hmm. Lighting is very important too, isn't very it? Very key, very key. Mm -hmm. There's many lights throughout this entire yard. It's just that the effect that you'll see is during uh, the nighttime. During oh, the day, yeah. the secret is you don't see that effect. Right. At night, you see it all. That is key. So that would be, that'd be a great if, you know, if we were able to show everybody what you've done with accent lighting because we know how important accent lighting can be. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can really just change again dark little corners into little yes. highlighted areas. Yeah, exactly. So again, people who are looking to invest in their property, there are lots of options even if you have the smallest piece of land. Obviously we have something really different here mm -hmm. and again not everybody has a stream running through their front I yard. I know, this is um, a lovely part so of it. So this is pretty cool. But you can work with the property and you can figure it out and that's probably so much fun about your job. It's, yeah, it's artistic, that's what right? I love to do every day. People will it's call creative. me up and say help me create that outdoor room environment right. and it's not, I don't feel like it's a job, it's mm -hmm. a passion of mine. I love creating those outdoor living spaces for mm -hmm. people. And you have uh, the new Natural Landscape magazine that is out for the fall. Yes. And uh, again, people can get it in pretty much anywhere at this yeah, point, right? Yeah, some great so stories in this, this yeah, fall issue. It oh, looks yeah. really, really good to feature on uh, Muskoka. And uh, of course, you know, you can uh, go online as well yes. onto your website and uh, you can get a subscription so it's sent to your house. So That's right. some really nice features. And again, it's about our environment here mm -hmm. where we live and what works for us in this area, which is great versus, you know, talking about places in the U.S. that right. don't pertain to us. So, no. so and what East we're Coast dealing to with. West Coast, right across Canada. I love Lots it. Lots of great content. Canada. In Very cool. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Always great talking to you. Great property. And we thank the homeowner for letting us uh, come and hang out. We're not leaving. <laughs> Okay, maybe we will, but we'll yeah. come back for a party or something. That's, That's it for it. now. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Lizzie. We'll be back with more chair at home. When I dream, I dream in color. When I think of color, I think of Tara. Make your dreams come true. At Terra, where color lives. Heritage Perennials. Look for us in the blue pots.
Good morning, welcome back to Terra at Home. We are at Dunder and Castle today and edging closer towards Halloween. We thought it'd be a great idea to talk about death and dying. So we're here with Bridie. So nice to join you on this <laughs> Thank you. very dark day. But you guys have really interesting tours for the month of October where people can come and learn about death and dying back in the day. Right, so in the Victorian time period, the uh, elaborate rituals around funerals uh, were very typical in Victorian homes. Mm -hmm. um, and here at Dundurn Castle, there was, of course, uh, members who died in the house. There's a family burial ground, which we talk about. Uh, we talk about clothing, about food, uh, about how you would carry a body out of the house. So very small details. And um, we have in the entire month of October, tours operating that so way. people can come and take these tours and really right. learn more about that side of things, right? I think anybody who's been in the area has been in Dundurn Castle before as a child or as an adult, and it's quite a lovely experience to learn about the family and uh, but it is nice to see the other side and unfortunately there was a lot of death and dying back then and um, let's talk about maybe some of the the common ailments and illnesses that people were suffering from right so um, the the leading cause of death for women at the time is childbirth uh, so it's usually about mm -hmm. um, five in a hundred women uh, dying from childbirth at the time the life expectancy sure. for a woman in Toronto in 1851 is actually 44 years of age for a man, it's 40. Uh, for a male labor, it's 35 and under. Wow, so we've pretty much almost doubled that. Right, yeah, so so we're doing pretty well at we the time. Are. Yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> this is good. Um, so medicine coming into the home, now if you had a do if you could afford a doctor to come into the house, and he's a gentleman, uh, usually a family friend coming in, he doesn't do uh, bone setting or dealing with blood, so he's coming to administer medication. So typical medicine would be things like ether, opium, arsenic, mercury, uh, champagne, brandy, and soda. <laughs> yes, um, we have a diary from the, one of the McNabb daughters, and she talks about uh, Mama receiving medication in the morning from the doctor, which would consist of these ailments, uh, which would aid in these ailments, sorry. Right. And then in the afternoon, a tumbler of beer and a plate of oysters would make her strong and fit to take on the day. So <laughs> nothing like arsenic Amazing. in the morning and beer in the afternoon, right? Wow, mm -hmm. times have changed. The beer in the afternoon part's still happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, depends on how Irish you are. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> so true. Uh, so when you would have a funeral in the house, you would have funeral invitations being sent out from the family. Uh, so the lady of the house would usually be responsible for this, and the borders actually on the invitation were quite important. So the thicker the border, the closer you were to the family members. Mm. Uh, and when a family is in mourning as a guest, you would come and drop off a calling card with one of the servants, so in this house it would be the butler, and say that you have come and visited the home, and when that family is ready to come back into society, Society, then that you know that you're able to visit them because you've left a calling card so um, yeah it's quite a it's quite a, a typical dance that you do at the time sure. um, then we have funeral biscuits and invitations which on the tour um, when we do our evening tours you do get to taste the funeral biscuits as well so it mm -hmm. usually consists of some kind of shortbread uh, which in this family you could have white imported sugar it's $75 mm -hmm. per delivery very expensive Wow and so they'd have them wrapped up right like so you wrap it in um, a prayer paper mm -hmm. and then you use a wax seal uh, with a stamp on the top so we were saying, you know, obviously there, it doesn't matter whether, you know, how much money you have, people die and people yes. get sick. So in, you know, in typical fashion, when you're looking back, back in say the 1850s, when someone was very poor, yes. obviously they couldn't do a lot of these things. Yes. So it would be um, a lot Right. Sure. Sir Alan McNabb, so the man who um, built Dundurn Castle, mm -hmm. uh, his funeral was $125. The girl who <laughs> washed the dishes here made less than $2 a month. Uh, so that's an obscene amount of money for mm -hmm. someone. For servants who couldn't afford to buy elaborate black uh, crepe clothing, mm -hmm. um, you could actually take your servant clothing and okay. you would dye it. Um, so this is, mm. it was used black dye, but it comes out in different colors. Uh, so the period of mourning, you should be wearing black fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, following the tradition of Queen Victoria, she wore black for 40 years after her husband passed. Right. Uh, so if you couldn't afford it, you could dye your clothing. So this was originally a bonnet oh. that was dyed. Mm -hmm. um, and because of the children's, uh, the infant and children mortality rates being high, uh, you could take black fabric and put it around the edge of the clothing as well. Wow. Um, so that would be uh, typical to wear if you couldn't afford it at the time. Now the funerals can get elaborate. You can pay someone to be a crier at your funeral. So follow behind in the hearse and cry behind. You could pay for that service. Uh, for some families you couldn't afford uh, to bury them in the family burial ground or the ground might be frozen. So you'd have to put them somewhere else 
until you could take them to a proper cemetery. And depending on how you died as well, as if you were allowed to be buried in that particular cemetery, if you died of suicide, you weren't allowed to be buried in church grounds as well. And we mm -hmm. talk all about that during our month of mourning visits as well. So we were, you know, we were focusing on, on the adults dying and, and, you know, of course, mothers, as you say, of childbirth. But what about children themselves? What were we seeing back then? That Again, lots and lots of children. Right. Fam large families. Yes. But they would lose sometimes half of their children. Right. Um, so the records we have for Belleville, Ontario in 1871, uh, show that 35% of all deaths were children ages 5 and under for that year. Uh, so extremely high. And what didn't help was the medication that children were being given at the time as well. It would actually cause seizures and convulsions. Mm. Uh, so that didn't help. And there was also the risk of that they're using oil lamps, uh, they're burning sometimes all night long, burns on coal stoves, uh, houses catching fire as well, sure. so there's also those risks. Lots of fires back mm -hmm. then too, right? Yes. Now this is interesting, we should show this because you were saying that photography was very expensive back in the day, so this was another way of holding on to the memory. Right. Uh, so photography, or what is the earlier form of photography, daguerreotypes, don't become more popular until the late 1840s, and it's mm -hmm. quite expensive at that time as well. So before that, to keep the memory of someone who passed, uh, you could cut a piece of their hair and weave it into hair tree, hair wreath, hair jewelry was very common as well. Uh, and they would wrap it around horse hair and you could add embellishments like jewels also and you keep the memory of someone who passed. So it's not just for funerals, but it would be typical to keep the memory of someone who died after. But that definitely is something, you know, again, you're holding on to. It's right. very indicative of who that person yes. was, right? So yeah, they've created flowers and everything. Like yes. Wow. Well, and the flash, when you did have a, a, a portrait done, I mean, it could take three to ten minutes for the flash to go off. So you could really take your own selphie in the Victorian time period. <laughs> you could really set the camera good. and then come back. If they could only jump forward to see how <laughs> what we do nowadays. Right? I mean, I put down these phones, they would probably just lose their minds. So other parts of the morning and in the very dark period of time, obviously, again, you were talking about in the black clothing, but also mm -hmm. um, draping black cloth over mirrors. Right. It's, an, you, it's, it's very typical to stop the clocks and to drape the mirrors in the home uh, because you don't want the soul of the deceased to get trapped in the home. You want to make sure that they carry on to the afterlife properly. Uh, mm -hmm. So you'll see all the mirrors in the home during uh, the month of October and Dundurn will be covered as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, how long would this carry on for? Would it be a day of mourning? Would it, did it depend on, on you right. know, so there's, the um, level in the community? The Martha Stewart of the day, her name was uh, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, and she recommends that a period of mourning if for a spouse, for a child, for a grandparent, there's different lengths of time you would have that. Mm -hmm. um, so if it is a spouse, uh, it sh women should be in deep mourning, which is wearing black, the mirror's drape, uh, a mm -hmm. black wreath on the door, some sort of symbolism on the outside of your house that mm -hmm. you're in mourning. And that would usually be a, a year to 18 months. I see. Wow. Um, and you should not be, it says you should not be going out to any sort of gay events in society yes. as well. So you're not to be seen. You're not allowed to be happy. Um, no, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen would be wearing uh, a black armband so that if they, right. when they do go out in society, theirs is not as strict, so it's usually about mm -hmm. six months to a year. Um, and they are wearing a black armband to symbolize to society that they're in a state of mourning at the I time. Um, and so there's different uh, regiments about how long you go into mourning for, depending on how involved you were with the family member society. All right. Well, Bridie, we, I, could, I could talk to you for hours <laughs> about this, but the best part is, is to come to the tour here at yes. Dundurn Castle Experience for the whole month of October and uh, learn more about this. And again, Dundurn Castle right here in our community. Thanks, Bridie. Thank you very much. Good information. I'm so sorry for your loss. We'll be back <laughs> with you. more Share at Home. <laughs> when I dream, I dream in color. When I think of color, I think of Tara. Make your dreams come true at Tara, where color lives. You've sat under them and built forts in them. You've swung from them and fell out of them. You've even fallen in love under them. Trees have always held a special place in our hearts and memories. A natural beauty, trees will grow with you and your family and bring color and nature into your world. For your assurance of quality, look for trees and shrubs with the Medallion Plant Tag. Medallion Plants, locally grown, the pride of Niagara. AM 900 CHML is giving you more news when you want it most. Non-stop news weekday mornings 5 till 9, weekday afternoons 3 to 6, with weather and traffic on the 9s. Hear about it first from AM 900 CHML, Hamilton's news talk leader. The Hamilton Spectator, at work, at home, or on the go. Read us online, in print, or download us to your e-reader. Get the Hamilton Spectator any way you want it.
Welcome back to Terra at Home. We're back with Chef Mark from La Piazza Allegra restaurant in Hamilton. And uh, cooking in the kitchen today, we're making yes. pizza. We're making a pizza. Awesome. Yeah, now this one is a little bit different than your traditional pizza. This is, potato pizzas in Italy are mm -hmm. very, very, very popular. Yes, but not really here not at here. all, right? People don't think about putting <laughs> carbs on carbs. Uh, carbs on carbs, <laughs> but in Italy they do it quite often. Mm -hmm. And this is a nice pizza because it's a, it's a, a combination of that white bread pizza Mm -hmm. as well as the potato and we're going to add some leek to it mm -hmm. and just olive oil and stuff like that so it's a nice fall kind of okay wintery type pizza so what we have here pizza dough mm -hmm. make it fresh make your fresh pizza dough this is the best way let he it proof it like over it's like so easy let it proof <laughs> overnight in your fridge covered and then take it out let it come to room temperature and then you just stretch it out and the other thing you need you need a good well seasoned pizza pan like this one here you need That's, a well seasoned. That is a well this seasoned is a well pizza seasoned pan. pizza pan. This is my favorite pan for making pizzas. Um, <laughs> it's so just, cute. you know what? It's got a lot of history. Yes. A lot of pizzas have been made on this one. Yes, so. a lot of good times come from that pan. A lot of good times come from that pan. That's right. Okay, what we're gonna do now? Obviously, the potato is raw, so we have to be careful how you you cut it. Mm -hmm. So I have my mandolin here, and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm just shaving it, and this is about the thickness we're looking at here. Okay, and you're okay. leaving, uh, you're noticing you're leaving the skin on as well. Yep, it's very rustic. This is a very mm -hmm. like rustic um, style pizza. If you do use a mandolin, please be very careful. They are extremely sharp. A lot of people don't like using them. No, it's just, it just scary. It scares people, it yeah, does. Yeah, scary. Now, if you have that and you're waiting for the pizza, mm -hmm. you do this, you make it a little bit thinner and you can make some nice potato chips, fresh potato chips out of Well, I was just gonna say, they're actually thicker slices than I was expecting you to do. But with that though, it's gonna give you, you're gonna get more potato flavor and you're gonna get the consistency, right. right? That's right, more potato flavor, a little bit more water content, okay? Mm -hmm. So you do want a little bit on there because you're just putting olive oil. See, sure. when you put tomato sauce on a pizza, there's a lot of water in tomato sure sauce is. anyway, but this yes. one's just an olive oil. I've discovered that when I've put too much tomato sauce on my pizza, because I think that'd be a soggy. really great idea, and it's just soggy. It gets soggy, that's right. So we're gonna make some nice herbs here. I have some chives, I have some rosemary, and mm. I'm gonna and again, the herbs are going to be very important with this because of just having tomato and or potato and leeks. That's right. Just have the herbs is what's going to, as you say, adds to that whole rustic, just very... Mm. And gives it a lot of flavor. A lot of flavor. So, and we're just going to give it a chop. You want to keep it fairly small when you chop this. You don't want too many big, big pieces there. Okay. And if you notice, I just put the rosemary on top. Yes, just go right in there with it. And we have our brush. Mm -hmm. We're going to brush the olive oil onto the pan onto the pizza dough and you want to cover it all the way around so we're going to do this now if you want you can add things to this that go well mm -hmm. potato leek pancetta or bacon mm -hmm. excellent oh, so yes. you can add all that as well okay. um, in europe they add they almost turned it into a carbonara they add egg to it and pancetta so you have some egg on there now there's oh, a couple goodness. ways you can do that if you, if very traditional ways to actually crack a whole egg and put it right on the pizza and bake it with a raw egg. Yeah, you guys do that a lot. Eh? Yeah, they do it quite a bit. <laughs> they do. Um, if you want something that's a little bit more mainstream, I would say scramble it, let it cook, and then add the egg on top as a really? scramble. Really? Well, it's giving you good, some good solid protein, that's for sure. And add those herbs. And we're gonna take some garlic. I think the best thing about pizza is generally pretty much almost everybody in the world likes pizza because you can make it your own. You Whatever it, flavors right. you like and the fact that you again can use olive oil or tomato sauce, some people use barbecue sauce, the, the, the options are so, I mean, it's just, it really is. They are and, they, and it is very personal, like you can mm -hmm. make this as any way you want, mm -hmm. which is excellent. Now. The one thing you do have to add, which you normally don't add on pizzas, but you have to add salt because you're putting on raw potato. Right. And every starch needs salt. Okay. So yeah. I'm gonna put some on Where the it's crust. Where it's gonna be very bland from that very perspective, bland. right? Okay, I was wondering when the salt was coming in. I knew you'd have to, yeah. salt and pepper, right? A Little bit of pepper. Mm. And now we're gonna throw our potatoes on. And you can put them out like pepperoni if you want, where you're gonna have your slices, or you can just throw them right on. I think what's great about pizzas as well, you can have, it's, it doesn't have to be fancy, and but you can open up a bottle of wine, have friends over, make a bunch of different types of pizzas, sit around That's and right. talk, and and it's just, just make a whole variety, and uh, it's just such a crowd pleaser. There we 
Oh, we take some of our leek. The leeks I'm going to do lengthwise. Okay. Just to kind of keep the shape that we already have going on there. Mm -hmm. I'll throw that on. Hmm. And now we're going to drizzle it with a little bit more olive oil, and this is going to help those potatoes cook. Okay. So we're going to hit that with a little olive oil. Because you did quite a light brushing of olive oil on the That's on right. the base, right? It wasn't as much as I, th I kind of thought would be there. So, so by because you you're adding it there. <laughs> we're adding it there again. Some more salt, and that's mm -hmm. going right on top of the potatoes this time. And make sure you wash your, wash your leeks very well, right? <laughs> yeah, the middle of the leeks will get very dirty mm -hmm. uh, from growing, so you do want to wash those. Um, but again, that's the potato pizza. Now you're going to put this in the oven. Now you, the only thing with this is because there's no tomato sauce and cheese that's insulating it, you have to be careful that you don't burn it. Well, that's right, there's no cheese on this right there's now. There's no cheese yet. Oh. We're going to put the cheese on after. If you put it on now, it'll dry it out. It won't let the potatoes cook properly. It'll get crusty before the potatoes are even cooked. Oh. So you do want to leave those potatoes for a bit in the oven cooking. Okay. So I would say put that in around 400 to 415, mm -hmm. middle rack, mm -hmm. and then just keep an eye on it and see if you have to adjust that going up or down to make sure that you you okay. know, you're browning it as mm -hmm. well as cooking the potato without burning the bottom. Okay, and it roughly is tricky. for how long? Uh, I would say about 20 minutes. Okay, and then taking it out and putting cheese on top and putting it back in, or uh, not? You can, you can put it back in if you want. I was gonna do it when we take it out. Yep. We're gonna put some cheese on top and after you it cut it. Leave it as is. Okay, all right, what we'll yeah. do, we'll take a quick break. We'll come back and uh, so we'll get it in the oven and uh, get it going and then we'll show you what it all Finish looks like at the end. Up. I can't wait to try it. I'm so excited. <laughs> awesome. Good. I love pizza. I don't care what you put on it. All right. We'll be back with more Terra at home in just a few. When I dream, I dream in color. When I think of color, I think of Terra. Make your dreams come true at Terra, where color lives. The Hamilton Spectator, at work, at home, or on the go. Read us online, in print, or download us to your e-reader. Get the Hamilton Spectator any way you want it. Welcome back to Tara at Home. We're back in the kitchen here with Chef Mark and we have this lovely potato leek pizza that we just we pulled do. out of the oven. Looks fabulous on your good old standby pizza pan. My standby pizza <laughs> pan. There we go. That looks awesome. So you can see what happens here. The, the potatoes have softened up, yes. okay, which is what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. They're not crispy so that they're so crunchy and the, it's because of the amount of olive oil we put on there, the dough is still nice and spongy. It hasn't dried out or anything like that. So that's the key on this one. Right, and I, you know, it's, when you first hear about putting slices of potato on pizza, I kind of envision that they would crisp up, you know, but again, you made them a little bit thicker. A little bit thicker and you can see that, you know, they do dehydrate and they get thin again, but yes. they are holding, they're holding their shape. Right. They're not dry. Eh, we just cut it. You can use a pizza cutter. I've never used a pizza cutter. I'm not a big fan. I like using my I'm knife. Not for... a big fan. <laughs> I like pizza using my cutter. knife for everything. <laughs> of course. There you go. No, and then of awesome. course you take your. So at cheese. this point we hadn't had it, added any cheese at all to not it. Not at all. So We're finishing it off with the cheese. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And so then the other thing you can do if you really want to change it up a little bit. You can add a little brushed garlic olive oil around the outside, brush it one oh, more time, give it a little drizzle good. or something like that. That is but, always uh, good. Yeah, we'll just so leave it say, as is. As you say, always make your dough fresh from scratch. The night before. The night before. Has to sit in the fridge the mm -hmm. night before. Okay, look at that. That looks lovely. Very rustic. Very nice rustic. Looking. Perfect for this time of year, isn't it? That's right. That's good right. hearty red, glass of red wine and, and you're good to go. And away you go. You sit on the couch, watch yeah. your TV, eat your pizza and we'll and enjoy the night. I should remind everybody you can find these recipes on our website at terragreenhouses.com. Lots of great recipes from desserts to salads to sides and of course pizza and again pizza there's something for everybody so that's right. you know just experiment. Yeah, just you know Try add pancetta, pizza. bacon, yeah. whatever you'd like if you want to change it. You know what best way to make think about pizzas if there's a soup put it on a crust you got yourself a good pizza. Hmm, interesting <laughs> thought there Mark. <laughs> Thank you Mark always great to have you Thank in the kitchen. You. That's it for now have yourself a great weekend.